Well, hello again, friends, neighbors, fellow Christians, Bible students alike. I thank you for taking the time to uh, listen to these videos and want to touch on uh, once again uh, some of the things that uh, this uh, Stephen Whitsett has presented in this little video, the three arguments that uh, I've already posted one video dealing with the first argument. And the second argument was, uh, and, and you got to understand that uh, Stephen doesn't believe that all prophecy has been fulfilled. So when he runs into a passage like this right here in Luke 21, and verse 22, where Jesus in the Olivet Discourse said in verse 20, when you see Jerusalem encircled with armies, then know that the desolation there is nigh. He tells those who be in Judea to flee to the mountains, and he says in verse 22, for these are the days of vengeance, that all things, all things, not notice that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Well, now this, uh, this throws a wrench into uh, Stephen's paradigm because he can't allow all scripture to be fulfilled otherwise his paradigm is confuted so what he argues is he goes to Luke chapter 24 and verse 44 and he says that the passage in Luke 21 22 is no different than the passage right here where Jesus says these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the, in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. But notice Jesus has a qualifier. Jesus places a qualifier in this statement concerning me. Okay, so when Stephen looks at this passage here in Luke 21, 22, then he says, well, this, this must just mean the same thing because it, again, this, this can't, this can't, uh, mean exactly what it says because that confutes his paradigm. So he goes to Luke 24 and 44 and because Jesus inserts a qualifier into this text then surely because Stephen has a degree and because Stephen is very very smart then Stephen is allowed to insert a qualifier into this text where Jesus placed no qualifier in the text. But you see, see Stephen is making a, uh, a couple of mistakes here, one of which is very obvious here in Luke chapter 24, and that is he is ignoring the context because when we back up a little bit here, we see that Jesus appeared to them right here in verse 36, as they, the disciples, thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. So he appeared to them in the, in the middle of the room, doors closed. He just appears to them. And he says, peace be unto you. And this scared the disciples. They were terrified. <laughs> uh, terrified. They were terrified and affrighted. They were scared, okay? They, they supposed they'd seen a spirit. Jesus asked them, why are you troubled? Why, why do these thoughts arise in your hearts? Now notice what Jesus says here. Behold my hands and my feet. Do you see that? Behold my hands and... Why would he show him his hands and his feet? Does that not imply that he is, he is uh, reminding them of the crucifixion, of, of Jesus' passion? The, hand, the, the holes that are in his hands and in his feet from the nails? Okay? Behold my hands and my feet that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they uh, yet believed not for joy and wondered, he, uh, he said unto them, Have you here any meat? So he takes a piece of fish and he eats there in front of them. So he ate before them. And then he said unto them, in the context of what he has just said here and done, okay, he said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, okay, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And there's the qualifier. But again, the other, another mistake that Stephen is making here is he is failing to realize what Jesus is referring to here when he says, 
in the context of behold my hands and my feet these are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet while I was yet with you okay Jesus is referring to what he had said to them while he was yet with them here recorded in Luke 18 then he took unto him the twelve and he said unto them behold we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets notice the qualifier concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished now not only does Jesus place a qualifier in the context here notice what Jesus says as he enumerates the things that are going to take place concerning the Son of Man for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit upon and they shall scourge him and put him to death and the third day he shall rise again now notice the third day he shall rise again that's what Jesus is taught that's the day that Luke 24 and verse 44 is transpiring on so when Jesus says These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he is reminding them of what he just said while he was yet with them that we just read there in Luke 18. And that is in the context of his crucifixion, his suffering, his being put to death, his resurrection. Okay, that's the context. And Jesus places this qualifier in the context here. And Stephen, because that uh, Jesus put, puts a, a, a qualifier in the context here and in this passage, then Stephen feels that he has the right to come to this passage because it confutes his paradigm by leaving it worded just the way it is and Stephen wants to insert a qualifier he makes up his own qualifier concerning the days of vengeance and he inserts the qualifier there into uh, the text and thus we see then that Stephen uh, in all of his uh, intelligence is uh, adding words to the Bible he is modifying the Bible, the scriptures. And he is, uh, apparently Jesus didn't know what he was talking about here and, and was not able to effectively communicate what he actually meant. So Stephen has to help the Lord out here by inserting this qualifier into the text where Jesus put no qualifier. But let's toy with this idea just for a few minutes here because Stephen admits that uh, by inserting this qualifier into the context here that all things which are written concerning the days of vengeance may be fulfilled or must be fulfilled then Stephen admits that all the things concerning the days of vengeance are fulfilled you understand that okay so uh, let's uh, let's look at this Let's, let's toy with this just for just a few minutes here. And I want you to look at... Let's go to... Uh, oh, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now notice here that Paul is writing to the Thessalonian Christians, Thessalonian brethren. And he says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you uh, all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecution. Now notice, he's writing to the brethren, okay? And he says, we glory in you in the churches of God because of your patience and your persecutions which you endure and your tribulations that you endure. See that? Okay. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer 
seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, who is the them here? Who, who does this pronoun refer to? Well, this is the persecutorial Jewish countrymen. As we read in his first epistle to the Thessalonians, For you, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ. For you also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. See that? The Jews, their own countrymen, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. Now notice, for the wrath is come upon them, who? The Jews, the persecutorial Jewish countrymen. The wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. And this is further corroborated when we look at Acts chapter 17, that the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, they said, uh, they brought them out and said, uh, these uh, men have turned the world upside down, and you can read on, uh, they troubled the people and the rulers of the city. They even pursued Paul uh, down to Berea and stirred up the people there. Uh, the Jews of Thessalonica. See that? The Jews of Thessalonica. That's, who's Paul, that's who Paul is writing to here. I mean, that's duh, like a duh statement, but Paul is writing to the Thessalonians, and it's the Jews of Thessalonica that had caused all this trouble. So, them, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now, why do I point that out? Why do I emphasize that? Because this was going to be a judgment against Israel the Jews. You see that? And to you, that's the Thessalonian brethren, who are troubled, rest with us when, there's a time word, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking what? Vengeance. Now remember, in Stephen's qualifier that he inserts into the context of Luke 21, 22, he thereby admits that uh, all things that are prophesied concerning the days of vengeance have been fulfilled. Okay? So Paul says here that the Lord Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on the Jews, Israel, the persecutorial Jewish countrymen, them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here is what is really interesting because Apostle Paul, actually Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit here through Paul is quoting Holy Spirit's own words. What do I mean by that? In flaming fire, you see that? You see the Lord Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. He's going to take vengeance, which Stephen admits all things written concerning the days of vengeance have been fulfilled. So, do you see where this is going? This text has been fulfilled per Stephen's assertion that when he inserts the qualifier into the text of Luke 21, 22, that all things written prophesied concerning the days of vengeance have been fulfilled. That's what Jesus meant. Stephen would have us to believe now. So then, what Paul is talking about here, this day of the Lord, day of Christ, that's what he's talking about. We beseech you, brethren, by the parousia of our Lord Jesus. <laughs> Wait till we get to that one. Uh, by the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the day of Christ, the day of the Lord. Okay. And this is what he's talking about right here. And this is what he had written to them about in uh, chapter 5 of the of 1 Thessalonians. And he had told them, the, Jew, the uh, brethren here, the Thessalonian Christians, that they knew perfectly of the day of the Lord, the appointed time, do you see that, of the times and seasons, they knew perfectly of the times and seasons of the day of the Lord, 
that was going to come like a thief in the night. Okay, they knew that. For when they, that's the persecutorial Jewish countrymen, shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as to veil upon a woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day, what day? The day of the Lord, coming like a thief in the night. That day will not overtake you like a thief. Well, why not, Paul? Because you know perfectly of the appointed times and seasons of the day of the Lord that's coming like a thief in the night. And guess what? This day of the Lord that's coming like a thief in the night is the Son of Man coming in the clouds of chapter 4. So, in context, 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, and 2 Thessalonians 1 are all fulfilled per Stephen's admission and his in, by his insertion of this qualifier into the text of Luke 21 and verse 22. But let's not stop there. I want you to look at this. As I said, Holy Spirit quotes Holy Spirit's own words. And this is King James Version here. And he said that the Lord Jesus was going to re be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. You see that right there? Paul is quoting verbatim. Let me emphasize verbatim from the Septuagint. Here it is, right here. Here's the Septuagint, right here. Okay? Note, all you have to do is look at the numbers. 1722, 5395, 4442. See that? 1722, 5395, 4442. Here's the Apostolic Bible Polyglot. 1722, 5395, 4442. This is the English translation that's based upon the Septuagint. Okay? And so Paul is quoting verbatim from the context of Isaiah 66 and verse 15. At the day of the Lord. So guess what? We're going to go look at Isaiah chapter 66. So, in verse, and notice that in the context, he says, Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake, that's the persecutorial Jewish countrymen. Okay? He's going to render recompense to his enemies. Well, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. And he says uh, here in verse 15, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. And this is the quotation. This is the King James Version. Uh, but this is the quotation. And here is what you just looked at that I had all three of the scriptures there on a page so you can see them together. 1722, 5395, 4442. Okay. Let's look at the context of this day of the Lord when he would come with fire. When he would come in flaming fire. Notice this. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh and the slain of the Lord will be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree and in the midst eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues and they shall come and see my glory and I will set a sign among them and I will send those that escape. Do you see that, brethren? Stephen, do you see that? I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations. And he names some here. Tarshish, Pul, Lud, that draw the bow, the two-bolt Javan, and the isles afar off that have not heard of my fame, neither have seen my glory. They shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. Now, brethren, this cannot be an end of time seen. This cannot be an end of time prediction because no one would escape the end of time. Okay, This prediction here, of which and from which Holy Spirit is quoting his own words. 
out of this context, okay, there's going to be some that would escape, okay, those that would escape, and they would carry the glory and the fame and the name and the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, that's what Paul told the Thessalonians. They would escape. They would not be overtaken like a thief in the night by the day of the Lord, okay? Now, watch this. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. Do you see that? This day of the Lord, when he's going to come in flaming fire and take vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. Paul is quoting that from the context of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Do you see that? And this, again, this is in the context. And here you have the same sentiments right here, that he will render recompense into their bosom. And it would be at the time of the inclusion of the Gentiles. It would be at the time that God would slay Israel, Judah, call his servants by another name, because he was going to create new heavens and a new earth, and the former heavens and earth were not going to be remembered nor come into mind. He's going to create New Jerusalem. Do you see that? Behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. Now look at here. The voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There's the resurrection. In the context of what Paul quotes of the day of the Lord, when he would come, he would be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. Okay, do you see that? And this, in context, the context from which Paul is quoting, includes the resurrection. It includes the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. And we could go to Revelation 21, but you all know that like the back of your hand. That that's the same thing as right here. The creation of the new heavens, the new, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, and the resurrection. This right here. Quoted in Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Okay? So, what we see then is that Stephen, in all of his education and in all of his intelligence, that he has very effectively demonstrated for you that just as I said futurists consistently ignore the context and they rip things out of their contexts so that they can redefine and reconstruct the scriptures as they isogeate their presuppositions into any text that confutes their opinion and this passage right here confutes Stephen's position. And it confutes Stephen's opinion. And it confutes Stephen Witsit's paradigm. So he is forced to insert, invent and insert a qualifier into the words of Jesus to reconstruct the words of Jesus where Jesus had no qualifier. Where Jesus has no qualifier, Stephen inserts a qualifier into the context. And as I said, Stephen very amply de demonstrates the very point that I made in the opening of my video that futurists consistently uh, isogeate their presuppositions and their bias into the texts and any text that does not suit their paradigm. Oh, and uh, let's recall what the Bible says in many places about someone who would alter the Word of God, like Deuteronomy 4.2 and Deuteronomy 12, the last verse in Deuteronomy 12. Uh, Revelation closes with the same admonition, don't add to, don't take away from or what's going to happen. 
it's pretty serious folks okay all right i think i've given you enough to think about and i appreciate your time uh, in these videos this evening uh, to uh, consider these things with me and uh, until uh, the next time again tune back in we're going to have a little bit more to say about uh, Stephen's uh, video as we debunk uh, his eisegetical objections so until next time thank you very much and you have a blessed evening